Welcome to this recording of Mac's live webinar that took place on the 30th of January in 2021. I'm Julie Calverley, a learning disability nurse, and in this session I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of Mac and something about um, what the science is telling us about how we can support the emotional and mental well-being. Um, and that's for everybody. The science um, about that is very much about how all of us can look after our, our emotional and mental well-being. We'll then go on to have a think about some specific considerations that we need to make when we're applying this knowledge and putting it into practice for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. And then I've got some examples of some strategies that you can use. These are simple, fairly easy things that you can have a go at, put into practice um, straight away. And then finally, we'll have a bit of a think about what, what's next. So um, some thoughts about what you might want to do after today's session and some of the ways that we might be able to support you in your, your roles and in the support that you give to people in this group. Um, so the, the history of NAC, um, we established just last year, and um, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, but I think actually the pandemic gave me the opportunity to, um, to kind of get cracking with the project because uh, my work was suspended and I needed to, to be at home. Um, it was a really good time to be doing this because of course emotional and mental well-being is high on the agenda and high on everybody's minds and, and well and truly needed at the moment. Um, but it was really this book, I think, The Body Keeps the Score, that gave me the impetus and was almost like, that's it, yeah, I've, I've got to get going with this because if anybody's read this and I can see a few people sort of nodding and smiling, so I'm guessing some of you may well have read this book, um, I'd recommend it. It's really interesting. It helps us to think about emotions and how we care for our emotional and mental well-being in a, in perhaps a slightly different way to how we may have thought about things in the past. Um, cognitive behaviour therapy and talking therapies have been very much dominant in our thoughts about how we care for mental health and what the body keeps the score does and what Bessel van der Kolk in that book does is talk about how how much the the body and the mind and our emotions are all so interlinked and that actually to care for our emotions and our mental well-being we can and need to also attend to the body. Um, now that's a very very brief summary of, a, of quite a lot of complexities in the book but to me that was really exciting because I thought well that's great because the people we're thinking about don't have the, the verbal and the cognitive capacities to access many of the approaches that are out there but there perhaps are plenty of things that we could do by attending to the body and the senses, um, the environmental engagement, and that could help them to, um, for us to be able to promote and, um, and help them to have better emotional well-being. Um, so this quote from Bessel van der Kolk on this slide is that one of the clearest lessons from neuroscience is that our sense of ourselves is anchored in a vital connection with our bodies. And again, really exciting for me because a lot of this stuff, it's, it's very much anchored in ancient wisdom and it derives from ancient tradition. But now with, with more neuroscience and more research being carried out in those areas, and for me certainly being a scientist by background, that's, that's been really exciting to me because I, 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 I'm an evidence person. I need to see you know, this works and why this works. So some of the things we're gonna be thinking about, including breathing practices and movement, um, you know, those, those things have been practiced for centuries, but now we know that from a neuroscience perspective, we know how and why those things can be so beneficial. Um, so back to NAC, um, in our organisation, it's not just me, um, we have a whole team of people, we have a committee of people who help to, to steer the direction of the organisation, we're a community interest company, so we operate in a way that any, profit, any profits that we were to make in the future would be put straight back into, into what we're trying to do, which is of course to promote the emotional well-being of, of this group of people. Um, we also have some wonderful volunteers with us, and one of one of whom is with us today. The, the existence of the website, the stuff that we're doing on social media, emails, etc., would not be possible without Marcus. So he's here now. So I'm going to take this opportunity to publicly thank him so much for everything he's done. Um, and we also, of course, have a wonderful group of people who have been supporting us with providing us with the guidance so if you've looked at our website already you'll see there's a whole range of guidance on there practical how-to guides on what you can actually do to support emotional and mental well-being i've written some of that myself i've written some of it with friends and colleagues but um, a lot of it's been contributed by people with a whole wide range of, of expertise in in this field Okay, so that's a little bit about the background. There's lots more to say, but just at the moment there to say thank you to all those people who make who make what we're doing possible. 
emotional and mental well-being is so important for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. We know that this group of people are experiencing um, communication difficulties that make it difficult for them to know what's happening in their lives in the present and what's going to be happening next and that can cause a lot of uncertainty, a lot of feelings of unsafety for them. Um, also a lack of ways and means of being able to express themselves that that can be a major challenge for people and and that's partly of course that's for us to be able to to try and interpret those those expressions and enable those people to facilitate their feelings better many of the people we're thinking about today may well have to endure unpleasant experiences sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis and may be experiencing a lot of pain and discomfort as a result of the some of the physical difficulties they may have as well and if anybody suffered with long-term pain they'll know that that can have a really profound effect on, on our emotional well-being and um, this group of people are also by definition at the early stages of development and again by definition this means that they are reliant on other people to support with their their self-regulation uh, if someone's operating at that early infancy level then they will need other people to to help to manage um, manage their emotions and manage those arousal levels and um, we'll come back to have a think about some of those points later on um, and then lastly of course loss and grief which is um, a major consideration at the moment for for many of us um, for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities they can experience an awful lot of loss and change in their lives with the people they're supporting them needing to move on often um, a whole range of reasons but but again, we know that loss for all of us is a major risk factor for our mental health. And I think this group of people are particularly susceptible to experiencing that and also susceptible to experiencing it in a way that could be quite traumatic for them. Um, I just can't imagine what it would be like to lose somebody and not have any ability to cognitively process that or the ability to talk to people about my feelings around that. So. Um, that was a very brief kind of um, rundown of some of those issues, but you know, all of those things can lead us to experience more depression and more anxiety in our lives. And it's something that, um, again, I'm pretty sure that I'm sort of preaching to the converted here, but the reality is in the in the medical world and in some of the other um, areas out there, people, you know, they're not so aware that um, that this group of people are are as and if not more susceptible to mental health problems than than the rest of the population. Okay, so NAT guidance is designed to help to promote emotional well-being, but this is a bit of a sort of a, a, a disclaimer and a, and a let's be careful moment because we're really clear that the guidance that we're putting out there, it's about, about promoting emotional well-being, it's about preventing mental health problems, and um, this is not to replace the need for, for clinical help if you have concerns about someone's mental well-being and you think they're at risk of some mental illness, then it's really important that you seek professional help for that. And um, PAMIS have a really useful public publication, which I've, I've popped on this slide and will, of course, be emailing that out to you. In that publication, responding to the mental and emotional needs of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities, they list some of the some of the signs and symptoms that might indicate that a person is struggling with their mental health. And those are the things that we would want to be very vigilant for do something about if we um if we if we saw those and and seek that professional clinical help where necessary okay so just moving on now to have some thoughts about what do we actually mean by emotional well-being um this was actually one of the more interesting slides for me to put together and and i think it would it took it, it was quite a, a later on in my putting together the presentation that I actually went back to think about what we're we actually talking about here. And I think we can make some assumptions about what we mean by emotional well-being. And, and I wonder if we ask people out on the street if they would think that it kind of equates to being happy. Um, well, perhaps being happy is a really nice thing to be. And if we spend more of our lives happy, we're, maybe we've got more emotional well-being. But I think we know now that it's a lot more complex than that. And um, I think one of the things that neuroscience is telling us that really this um, sense of emotional well-being is very much based on us feeling safe and feeling safe in our bodies. That's really important. So um, that will enable, enable us to have a sense of ease, um, enable us to feel calm, connected. And that's, of course, that feeling of being connected is also going to be fostered by having the possibility of being connected to others. So facilitating the possibility for interactions and being able to feel pleasure. Um, so this isn't about just feeling good all the time. It's actually about being able to feel a range of emotions 
but then being able to calm when we need to. So this very much links to the ideas about self-regulation and regulation. Emotional regulation will put us in a much better, healthier state of emotional well-being. We don't want to just feel the same all the time. So sort of as a practical example of that, you know, I've, I've felt quite nervous this morning because I'm giving this presentation and it means a lot to me that I do well and that the, the message has come across well. That makes me nervous. But actually having a little bit of nerves is very valuable because that should, in theory, make me perform better. So being just emotionally the same all the time, that's not that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for people to experience life and to experience a whole range of feelings and emotions, but to be able to manage those. And I think for many of us who've worked with this group of people, we'll have come across those who, who get excited. And that's wonderful. We want them to feel excited and we all want to experience excitement. But then what happens when that excitement gets too much and becomes overwhelming and it becomes out of control? So what we need to help to facilitate in people is that ability to be able to regulate and to be able to come back, back down from that excitement safely and, and securely. And like I've said, for many of these people, we're thinking about, if not all, um, they're going to need our help to do that very often so we've got some ideas about how we can help them so these are just some ideas but I think this is an area that um, would be good to sort of look in a bit more there's no sort of absolute accepted definition of what emotional even what emotions are let alone what emotional well-being is but I think it's true to say that regulation is an important part of that and by regulation what we mean is the ability to modify adjust or control for optimal functioning so being well regulated enables us to manage our emotional responses and keep them within a healthy range of reactions. Um, as an example of, of an unhealthy reaction, again, most of us will know people who may, may self-injure, they may bite their hand, for example, when they're struggling to, to regulate those feelings. So we might argue that's perhaps not such a healthy way of regulating. Um, a better way of regulating might be to, to seek a hug from somebody else. You know, that, that could be a way still to calm us down, but, but a way that isn't going to do us any harm and be much more positive. Okay, so within our ability to, to regulate, um, the nervous system has a really important role to play. And, and this linked with these ideas about um, our understanding now that, that the, the way that the mind and the body are so much linked together, they're not separate. It was seen previously, one of the sort of philosophical ideas being that the mind and the body are separate. And I think we still see that in the medical profession, the tendency to want to treat us as individual parts of a whole. It's, I don't believe that's what we are. And I think generally it is accepted that the mind and the body are very much linked. And we could describe this as there being a bi-directionality of mind body. So our brain is sending messages to our body and the body is continuously providing information back to the brain. And um, so what this tells us is of course that, that we need to attend to the body and particularly to the nervous system in order to attend better to our emotional well-being. So I did say that um, there aren't any acceptable um, definitions of emotions, but this, this definition, I think, I think I'm okay with it and I think this is, this is kind of helpful for us. But emotions are biological states that are associated with the nervous system brought on by neurophysiological changes and variously associated with thoughts, feelings, behavioural responses and perhaps a degree of pleasure or displeasure. And so again, coming back to this idea that emotions are very much kind of almost grounded in our nervous system. So if we can attend to our nervous system, we could help to have better emotional well-being. Um, mental well-being. Um, could be defined, well it has been defined by the Department of, Department of Health as a positive state of mind and body, feeling safe and able to cope with a sense of connection with people, communities and the wider, and the wider environment. So again now that kind of sense of the whole integrated whole between ourselves, other people around us and the environment and crucially our own bodies. So this, this slide here, the NHS Five Steps to Mental Wellbeing, this is, um, this is a fairly recent um, thing from the NHS. The, the NHS, have, they're doing a lot of work at the moment to promote emotional wellbeing amongst the population. And, but I think that something's being missed, isn't it? Because, I mean, I've done a lot of research on the internet looking for strategies and approaches, how we support 
people who are non-verbal who don't use symbolic um, language to communicate how do we support their emotional men mental health it's it's very hard to find much out there at all um, it's not just this group of people I think the the strategies and the approaches we're looking here would also apply to people who've got dementia um, and people who have brain injury as just to two other groups of examples there so but but good the, the good thing and the positive thing here about these five steps to mental well-being that the nhs are promoting is that they are really recognizing this recent um, neuroscience that's come out that tells us the importance of connecting with other people being physically active and they talk about learning new skills as well um, giving to others and paying attention to the present moment, um, which is a definition of, of mindfulness. So again, thinking there about how it's that integration of connecting the body with people around us and, and with our, ourselves. So science is informing us that emotional well-being can be improved with natural non-pharmacological approaches. And the good thing about these as well is that they don't really require, a lot of them don't require any special equipment and they don't need any particular skills. Um, we can do a lot of stuff and we do do a lot of this stuff for ourselves um, on a day to day basis. We might do that consciously or unconsciously. So an example of a already given one of an unconscious way is if we're feeling a bit down, if we're lucky to be living with someone at the moment, we might ask them for a hug. And that, that has a really regulating effect for us. Um, or we might decide to go out for a walk and get some time in the fresh air and be in nature. Um, so what NAC's done is take those ideas about we know what's good for us all and why wouldn't those things also be good for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities but of course we know that we need to make some adjustments to make them appropriate for a group of people where there's a lot more considerations that, that we need to make and for that person they can't they can't necessarily know themselves what they're needing in any moment so our job is going to be to to assess their nonverbal communication and, and what's going on for them and, and try to provide them with a, a range of things to to support their mental health. So NAC is providing guidance on how people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities can benefit from what others would actually perhaps use as self care approaches. And like I say, they might be consciously or unconsciously. Mindfulness has become huge. Um, I don't think you can go into a shop these days without finding a mindfulness colouring book. Um, that, and, and we can access a lot of this stuff on the internet and, and we don't have to pay for it either. And that's something that was being really important to me in the creation of NAC. That I think that people with who are nonverbal, who aren't using words to communicate, I would like them to also be able to access what we can access free of charge. Could they not access those things free of charge so so at that level that's why i was so keen that we get some of that guidance guidance put out there and people can freely access that so science tells us that emotional well-being can be improved with natural non-pharmacological approaches that involve the body interactions with others and our interaction with the environment and also cultivating awareness of the present moment and these can all be effective because they have an impact on our nervous system and other systems of our body, um, such as the endocrine, endocrine system. They're very simple. Um, they don't take a lot of, for us to apply, they don't necessarily take a lot of skills. They might take a lot of practice. Um, but the skillfulness for us is about how we make that adap adaptation to people with severe learning disabilities. NAC website you'll find that the guidance on there has been divided into eight different categories so these eight different categories of experience are arts and creativity interactions and relationships mindfulness movement music nature senses and touch and the reason that we've got this whole range of experiences is because of course what what works for one person might not work for another person and furthermore, what works for me on one day might not be what I need the next day uh, or even moment by moment. So again, it's our skills as that person who's going to be facilitating an experience for someone who's reliant on our care to think about what does that person actually need in that moment? What's going to help them most then and there? But we all, I, I believe we all need a, a variety of strategies. You know, sometimes I need to be getting up and moving around and that really helps to sort of discharge my energy and to make me feel better. Other times sitting down breathing, you know, being calm is what I need. So um, a whole range of things. And these are things that we can do proactively. So they're things that we can integrate throughout our entire days and there should be things that we should choose things that we're going to enjoy ourselves as well so if we're there's no point in me trying to trying to do an hour of yoga a day it just doesn't work for me but actually I can 10 minutes of yoga I enjoy that that works for me so pick things that that you're going to enjoy and the person's going to enjoy 
it's really important that when you are choosing things to try with the people you're supporting that you do want to do them yourselves and you feel quite comfortable with them because your role as the facilitator is going to be really key in determining the quality of that experience for the person and we'll come back to that when we think specifically about the role of interactions in our emotional and mental well-being. So the, the website also enables you to create collections and um, so you can you can set up a profile for somebody that's entirely anonymized and then come back to it and be able to to, to try out the things that you've saved into that kind of collection of, of saved favorites. Um, we would suggest that you try things out, see what works, adjust things if they don't seem to be working and switch them out if they're not working at all. So there's, there's a whole range of things on there so that you can you can do that. Before you put these things into practice, there's a few things that we need to, to think about um, in relation to people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. I've already mentioned communication, the importance of your approach, um, how, how sensitively tuned in you are to that person, how well you're able to read all of their nonverbal signs that are telling you this is going well or this is not going well and how you need to respond to those and your own comfort and enjoyment, of course. Um, also, of course, the issue of consent. Now, um, most of the people we're thinking about, if not all today, won't be able to give us informed consent to particip participate in the, in the um, experiences that we're offering to them. So best practice, though, would suggest that we should be looking for signs of implied assent. So for the kinds of strategies we're looking at, they are non-invasive, they are non-intrusive. So legally speaking, from the Mental Capacity Act, you don't need to obtain informed consent. But from a best practice point of view, you should absolutely be looking for signs of implied assent right throughout the entire experience for that person. So what's the person doing that's telling you they're happy and accepting what you're offering? Or are they showing you actually they don't like it? And if they don't like it, change it or stop it. Now, we could do a whole session on this and perhaps we will do a whole session on this. But um, for now, um, I would like to just direct you to the website if you want to have a look at kind of some of those ideas about implied assent. I'll pop the, um, the link on there on that slide for you to, to have a look at that some more. Um, one of the other principles to think about is, is that that um, ability to understand what the person's telling you. We're never going to know for sure. We're, I think that's going to be impossible. We're going to have to make our best judgment. And our best judgment, I think, is going to be based on us getting a whole range of, of perspectives from the different people who know that person. And this is a quote from, from Annie Ferguson's report from 2008. And in that, they say that no individual has a monopoly on understanding this complex problem. It's therefore essential that the significant pool of expertise which resides amongst professionals and families is brought together in a more cohesive whole if improvements in response to mental health issues are to be achieved more effectively. Um, they're the families, that's the, families are very often the people who really kind of are holding the key uh, because they perhaps they've known that person for a very long period of time, they have that ability to tune in. But equally, you know, some of the staff that are working with someone may well have got some fantastic insights. So come back to that point about let's, let's take a team approach to this and do our best to, to understand that person's communication by by collaborating with everybody um, who knows them. So what we're going to look at particularly for the, the rest of the session today um, is some of the strategies that we might want to try for calming. So remembering going back to the beginning thinking about emotional well-being being about having a whole range of experiences and what people need at different times is for sure going to be different. Um, but today in the short time that we've got we're going to just have to think about some of what neuroscience tells us about how we can help people to calm and I think this is probably particularly important at the moment when we know a lot of people are struggling and suffering with their their emotional arousal with their emotional well-being because of what's happening with the pandemic um, for some people they're going to be experiencing a lot of trauma around this and I think that for some people with well actually for a lot of people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities they may, may well be experiencing trauma from a whole variety of things that may have happened in their lives um, that's something we're going to come back to on another session I'm planning some training specifically looking at some of what this neuroscience is telling us about trauma and how we can support people's mental health um, in a practical and sensitive way but for today, some thoughts on calming. So, firstly, actually, before we look at some specific strategies, we're going to have a think about some sort of underlining um, basics, really. And um, one of these is predictability. 
um, predictability is key for fostering a sense of safety and well-being. Um, if we're living in a situation of unpredictability, our body can go into hypervigilance or defense mode. I think that's going to be kind of apparent to some people at the moment because, again, the situation we're facing across the world is that we're living in highly unpredictable times and we can see with that and that's part of it rather that you know the the rise in mental health problems is is um is attributed to that as well as um, many of the other difficulties that it's presenting us with so what can we do to help people to feel a, sen a greater sense of predictability in their day-to-day -day life um, some of the things that we might want to think about would be personalised routines. So making sure that we've got the routines right for the person that we're that we're supporting. Um, this is not about being rigid and having a rigidity. We have to do things in this particular order. But the more we can have that sense of knowing what's coming next, because that's what we did yesterday, then perhaps we can help a person to feel um, a greater sense of safety um, in having that predictability communication getting the communication right for that person such as um, using cues on body signing things that, again that help to prepare the person for what's going to be coming next having a consistency of approach and that's both within our own approach but also amongst the different people who are supporting that individual and again it's not about rigidity it's good that people have different relationships with different people but also I think there needs to be enough kind of consistency that that person has that sense of being able to feel almost a sense of control in their day-to-day -day lives uh, and another thing to bear in mind is time for processing so to help someone feel a better sense of knowing what's coming next, we may well need to give them a lot longer than we often think we do um, to process that. So for example, if we are using an object of reference or an on-body sign, you know, make sure we give plenty, plenty of time for the person to actually process that uh, and to be able to, um, before we actually move on to do the next thing, because it's very easy for us to, to work too fast with someone who's struggling with their processing speed. And some other kind of underlining basics here, thinking about some, maybe some more about more specifically physical and sensory needs. So um, we know that the hypothalamus is involved in primary and simple th forms of soothing and calming. So thinking about pain and discomfort and how, how that may well impact on someone's emotional well-being and on, on us being able to facilitate other experiences that will help their emotional well-being. Giving a foot massage would be a lovely thing to do. But if the person's really uncomfortable because we haven't positioned them well, then actually that experience isn't going to be beneficial for them at all. And thirst, that's a really important one. Again, really connected to that issue of the hypothalamus, you know, making sure that we're attentive to all of these needs and almost getting the kind of the basics right for that person. Um, and temperature control. So, you know, is the person too hot or too cold? Um, and, and if they're feeling too cold, what about, you know, wrapping them with a nice blanket? And let's think about, you know, some of the other benefits of that might be about that experience of touch and just that experience of feeling more grounded by having a, a nice kind of cosy blanket um, wrapped around our shoulders. And also environmental sensitivities, um, we need to think about those and how, how draining that would be to be living in an environment that wasn't set up right for us. So um, make sure that we kind of do our best to get those things right and help bring some down somebody's reactivity, help to put them in a better state in terms of their nervous system so that they can feel a greater sense of well-being generally. Right, so the first kind of area of strategies that we're going to, to look at today are um, interactions, social interactions, um, possibly possibly the most important thing that we can do to support people's emotional well-being. Uh, this is a quote from Bessel van der Kolk, and back to the book that I mentioned earlier, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, van der Kolk says that more than anything else, being able to feel safe with other people defines mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. And moving on to another person who's been really um, important in the development of NAC, and that's um, Stephen Porges. Um, some of you might have come across him before. He's most well known for the polyvagal theory. And um, in this theory, Stephen Porges talks about how the autonomic nervous system is actually not quite as simple as people often think it is. So people often equate the autonomic nervous system with having a sympathetic nervous system, a parasympathetic nervous system. And um, he's actually talked about how there's a lot more branches 
and that when we're faced with fear, we may go into a sympathetic nervous system fight flight state, which is where the heart rate increases, or a parasympathetic system um, response, which is actually an immobility or freeze response. So rather than just thinking about having a, flight, a fight flight response, we need to bear in mind there's also the possibility of a freeze response. And that's really important. And I think a lot of our, I do wonder if a lot of the people that we're supporting often do go into that state when we're working with someone, seeing someone who's, you know, the small child who just seems to be so wrapped up in their own world and not really engaging with, with people around us. I wonder if, if perhaps sometimes they may well have gone into that kind of freeze immobility state. Now, these, these states that we go into when we're faced with anxiety and fear and, and trauma, they're designed to, for a survival system. So they're there for a good reason. But from an evolutionary point of view, we've got to the point where um, those responses aren't needed in the same way they used to be. So they can actually be kind of harmful to us if we stay in them for too long. So having a, a freeze state response can be really useful for us to preserve energy and to survive. But if we stay in that freeze state for a very long time, then that becomes really detrimental to our our health both physically and emotionally. So what Stephen Porges is telling us is that there's actually two branches to the parasympathetic nervous system that these also subdivide further. So one of these is the dorsal system and that's the rest digest part but there's also that freeze part so we need to remember that as well and um, one of them the other one is the, the the ventral vagus nerve now it's the ventral vagus nerve that we're going to think about particularly today because this is about modulating emotional response to social connection and this happens through facial expressions tone of voice and other non-verbals and that's part of the um, well, all of that makes up the the social engagement system so again for me when I'm thinking when I was thinking about creating that reading this work was really exciting to me because he's giving us an absolute understanding from a neuroscience point of view of why when we go to someone and our voice is calming and when out we can just have that soothing um, presence with that person we can actually make a, a profound impact on their emotional well-being we're going to move forward and think a little bit, bit more about the importance of interactions in order for us to be that present calm state for another person we need to be in a calm state ourselves so it's really important that we look after ourselves too now that's not always easy if you know a lot of us are living very busy lives so having time to do that can be very very tricky um we're not suggesting that people do need to go away onto retreats to do this but the more we can do to be aware of our own state be aware of our emotional needs and the better able we're going to be able to support the other person so we really urge you care for your own emotional well-being and if you care for your own emo emotional well-being that will have a positive impact on the people you're looking after and caring for as well and um, so being in that state of self-awareness and compassion can help us to remain centered and respond in ways that calm the other person's nervous system calm centered secure compassionate relaxed alert soothing presence is critical for supporting regulation and easing distress in another so back to the some ideas about the the nervous system so this vagus nerve that I've talked about is connected to the cranial nerves and it also goes to the face it goes to the the ears uh, the eyes and the mouth uh, and it also goes to the heart and the lungs it actually goes everywhere above the the diaphragm and it goes to the pharynx and the larynx and it's via this ventral vagus nerve that interactions can directly impact our neurophysiological state it's a highly evolved circuit so only only in mammals does it exist and it's through our facial expressions, the tone of voice, and together this all makes up the social engagement system. So one of the practical ways that we can activate this social engagement system is through our tone of voice. So this is, it acti by activating the social engagement system, it has a calming effect because mediated by the vagus nerve, which is also connected to the heart, the effect of the ventral vagus nerve is it, that it reduces our heart rate. So literally by us having a calm, and, and soothing tone of voice and increasing the prosody of our voice, we can activate the social engagement system of the other person. And this helps to put them in more of a calm state, partly because it also reduces their heart rate. So the slide that you've got in front of you at the moment is about increasing the prosody of your voice. And one of the ways to, to understand prosody is to think about what your voice sounds like if you tell a story to a child or perhaps a rhyme to a child. So you tend to find then there's a lot more intonation used and your voice almost becomes more sing-song like. So it's about adjusting the rhythm and the speed, the speed and the stress and the intonation of your voice, um, which provides more information 
and, and literally can, can access that, um, that nervous system in that way. Um, I haven't got time to show it to you today, but there, Stephen Porges has got a ton of stuff on YouTube. Um, I've got a reference at the end of the slides though, so do have a look at his work and he's lovely to, to watch and listen, although he's clearly got a huge brain and you know understands this stuff inside and out he's actually lovely to listen to because he really embodies what he says and he, and he talks a lot about how important it is that we're smiling with our eyes and how that affects the nervous system of another so i'd really recommend you have a look at um stephen porges work as well So this is um, moving on a little bit from interactions, but also interactions being really critical and key to the effectiveness of thinking about how we might use our breath to help to regulate the nervous system of somebody else. So again, back to the vagus nerve. Another thing that we know about the vagus nerve is that when we breathe slowly and extend our out breath, we activate that vagus nerve. Now this down regulates the sympathetic nervous system, reduces heart rate and therefore has a calming effect. So the breath is one of the, the, the easiest for us, the easiest, quickest, best ways that we, we know of, of how we can immediately alter and access our internal state. For somebody with a severe and profound intellectual disability, this is where it kind of gets more tricky, doesn't it? Because how, how do we support someone to do that? We can't often show someone or tell someone how to do that. They're not going to understand it. If we try to explain to them, try taking six breaths a minute and slow that out breath, that's, that's not going to work. So what we're proposing is that perhaps by using our own breath, because we know that another human being can resonate with our own nervous system, that might help the other person to regulate their breath. So for ourselves, doing things like chanting and singing and vocalising and playing instruments, those can all be really useful things for us to do because they can help slow our out breath. Um, so making sure that we're in a good place first, how would we apply that to somebody with a severe and profound intellectual dis disability? One thing to think about might be um, optimal positioning. So we want to make sure that they can breathe most effectively and positioning is very important for that. Um, another idea is about thinking about how we might sit with that person or be with that person. Where, where might we position ourselves to be with that person in that calm regulated state ourselves and use our own breath to help to regulate their breath. So there, because we know that another human being's nervous system can resonate with ours, it can become in sync with ours perhaps just being with that person in that calm present state, focused on our breathing, that could perhaps help to regulate the breathing of, of the other person. And for people who this is possible for, another thing to try might be back to back breathing. So if you could sit with your back to the other person, perhaps they would be able to then, and regulate your breathing, of course, um, perhaps they would then be able to feel your breath through the back. You could also feel their breath and you could sort of almost, almost play around with that very gently and sensitively and think about how, how that might impact on, on their breath rate. And for that type of experience, you'd need to think about either having another person present because you need someone to be able to see their face and to be able to feed back to you that they're OK with what's taking place. Or you could try using a mirror. But it's really important that throughout everything we do in all of these practices, we're always checking back with the person and making sure they're OK with what's taking place. So thinking about how um, some of the people we support use vocalisations. I'm wondering if sometimes those vocalizations and maybe some of the humming types of sounds that people make, could they actually be having quite a regulating effect? Are they things that we might want to almost tap into and maybe even encourage at times if we know that person's struggling with their, their regulation, we could actually help to support them perhaps by joining in with those vocalizations they're making as well. So these are all things that are sort of exploratory. Um, another one being blowing bubbles. Again, blowing bubbles, that's another great way of us being able to extend our out breath, therefore activating that ventral vagus nerve, lowering our heart rate, making us feel more calm, helping to regulate us. For people with a severe and profound intellectual disability, that could be tricky. Um, again, not everybody is able to blow those bubbles, but, but some are, so that's something to, to consider. And some of the guidance on our website which I've directed you to here is about how um, you can you can use bubbles to facilitate those kind of experiences. So maybe the person can't blow a bubble from the bubble wand. But what about if you blow the bubble and then, and then are they able to kind of blow the bubble once it's already been formed? So just some different ideas are things to play with. But all of these things aim to to get that person thinking about their breathing, becoming more aware of their breathing and focusing more on that on that out breath. Um, so in the last couple of minutes that I'm going to talk for, because I do want to leave some time for some questions, um, 
we just have to think about our body and how um, how important it is and how helpful it is when we can become more aware of our body state. So when we become more aware of our bodily states and sensations, we can feel more present in the moment and can better regulate our physiology and emotions. And this is one of the ways that we might be able to think about applying the ideas of mindfulness for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. Um, we can a lot of the mindfulness practices do involve thinking about our body. And one of the examples of this would be the, the body scan. And we've got a piece of guidance on the website to show you how to facilitate this for people you're supporting. And what this particular piece of guidance does, though, is it uses touch. So rather than the, the word to suggest that you become aware of a particular part of your body, which is what a typical body scan does. Um, this, this, this experience is using, uses touch to facilitate that. Okay. So touch, we know, um, can help us to be more aware and present in our body. And when we're actually disconnected from our body, it's difficult to regulate. And if some of this is feeling a little bit out there for you, this, it's not, it's got neuroscience to back it up for sure. Um, but it, it's quite simple in, in essence, because it's, it really is as simple as thinking, now that if I mention to you now, have a think about your, your left foot, focus on your left foot, feel your left foot, see if you can feel it in its sock or in its shoe or in its slipper, because a lot of us are at home. Maybe now you're thinking about your foot and the sensations of your foot and you can become quite aware of those. Now I'm going to guess that for most of you, probably all of you, before I mentioned that, you weren't really aware of your left foot at all, but because I've suggested you become aware of it. So that's kind of a really simplistic view of how a body scan would work. It would help you to kind of go through your body and become aware of different parts of your body when in a very regulating effect, helping us to become more attuned to our body and the sensations in our body. And if you remember back to what we said earlier about how important it is that we think about emotions as being linked to the body. So if we can help people become more aware of what's happening in themselves, we can help them to have more awareness of their emotions and that those emotions don't need to overwhelm us. So for people we're supporting, we can't use that suggestion. I can't say to someone necessarily and think about your left foot, but I could perhaps use touch and I could touch their left foot. And in, in a way that they were happy with and comfortable with and that might then help them to make that association and become more aware of the sensations that are taking place in their foot and of course other parts of the body too um, and to leave you just on one one kind of um of another another touch example this is from a guy called peter levine who's a biophysicist and psychologist i've referenced him at the end and he suggests that you take your your right hand and do feel free to try this with me now if you would like you can take your right hand and you can place it Place it underneath your, your but on your side, on your left side, just, just where your heart is, just underneath your heart. And then you take the other hand, your left hand, and place it just on your opposite shoulder, so on your right shoulder. And breathe, of course. And then what you might want to, I mean, I invite you to have a think about what you can sense there. For me, I've become now aware of my heart beating. My heart's beating a little bit more powerfully than it often is because I'm still a little bit nervous talking to a group of people um, but actually feeling for me feeling that sensation of my heart is actually quite calming for me and Peter Levine talks about how as well this sense of, of touch for ourselves can help us to feel a bit more contained he uses the word contained so I think for me that that's like being centered being grounded being, being able to feel more present where I am be a bit more settled again calmer so this is something we could try with the people we're supporting. We might be able to sit behind them if it was appropriate to do so and right to do so for that person and try um, either we can touch them in that way, uh, hold them in those places, or they might want to put their own hands there as well and have that kind of sense of feedback from, from their, own, their own hands touching themselves. That's going to be something to experiment with, again, gently, sensitively, always looking for indications of implied assent throughout everything that we do. Um, and there's some other examples there using touch, so like squeezing the body and tapping the body. So all these things are designed to help us to become more in tune with our body, more aware of what's taking place, to help to downregulate that sympathetic nervous system, take us out of that fight flight reaction that we get when we're, we're frightened and we're overwhelmed, um, and also take us away from that kind of immobility free state. Um, some a slide here on on what we need to look for to know whether these things are helping or not. So um, when we're never going to know for sure, are we? We can't know for sure what another person's experience is. 
um, but we can observe their expressions, their micro expressions, postures, micro postures too. look for the tiniest changes and um, gestures as well. Um, I mean, we do this all the time anyway, and we do it unconsciously, but we can also bring this into our conscious awareness to get to get better, get more attuned at looking for what's taking place for that person. One of the ways that we can help do this is through using video, being able to video people and, and um, reflect back on that video. We can see things that we just didn't see in, in the time, uh, and that can be a really powerful tool for, for getting more in tune with what's taking place for that, that person. Some of the things on this list, let um, me just read the list for those who um, are struggling to read it for any reason. Um, so it's about improved breathing, perhaps might be easier, steadier. We might see changes in sleep, so improved sleep or appetite, postural changes, for example, lifting of the head and extension of the spine, they could all be positive signs that what we're doing is working for that person. Changes in muscle tone, facial expressions, social engagement, um, looking at the eyes, what's happening in those oculi muscles around the eyes, because th those really do express our internal states. Um, so they're really, they're really key ones to look for. Um, we can look for behaviour changes and hormonal changes. And some of these now hormonal balance, neurotransmitter levels and heart rate. We, we, need, we need some monitoring for this and we desperately need some research into these areas to be able to see what's taking place. Uh, I was really fortunate to work with a lovely, lovely young lady. Um, unfortunately, for a period of time, she was in hospital. Um, during that time, though, she was she was hooked up to a variety of monitors. And um, what the nurses said to me after I'd spent about half an hour with her, and I was actually doing something very similar to the touch exercise we just did, where we put our hand underneath our arm by our side and, and one on my arm. And I was kind of doing that with her, really. And the, um, the nurses told me afterwards that her, all of her levels improved. So her heart rate dropped, her blood pressure improved and her oxygen rates improved. It would be great if we had everybody hooked up like that so we kind of see what's going on for them internally and and actually that those are the kind of things that would be really good to to look at doing in the future getting more more real real feedback about what, what's working for the people we're supporting um so how we can help you um we're trying to raise awareness of of the skills that people are already using that's a big part of what we're doing some of what i've talked about today you hopefully you're saying i already do that stuff that stuff i already do and maybe all you've learned today there's, there's a bit of neuroscience now that's, that's kind of backing up what you're doing i think it's really important that we recognize the skills of the people who are supporting this this vulnerable group of people um because you know they're they're really important skills that they're they're bringing to the people they support um, we're trying to provide easily accessible information. Um, the neuroscience is pretty complex. Some of it we want to try to offer it to people in a way that, that can make sense to them. Um, for our training, we can do a lot more of this kind of thing. We can, we can deliver training courses, um, assessments, individual assessments for people's needs and supporting with video feedback. So that's um, something that um, we would really recommend thinking about the use of video to be able to, to record what's taking place and help us to see what's, what's helping. And lastly, how can you help? Well, um, I really hope today's been useful for you. Um, and one of the things I'd really ask you to do, we're not asking any, any money from you, but it would be fa fabulous if you could let other people know NAC is providing a free resource via the website to people. The more it's there, the more people that can benefit from it, the better. We'd also really love to hear from you about what you need. Um, we are making funding applications, but to support those funding applications, we need to know what, what you want us to provide you that's to help you in your, in your, um, in your work and in the, the relationships you have with the people you support. And, um, and lastly, we'd love for you to get involved. I've mentioned it already. Um, we, would, we would dearly love to hear from any of you who would like to get involved in any capacity, whether that's giving us some feedback, whether that's getting involved in some of the committee work, whether it's joining me in what I'm doing and trying to kind of further the, our understanding of the science and in, in its application to people's emotional well-being. We're just very, very open to your, um, to your involvement and we'd love to, to have you on board. Okay, so you won't, won't be surprised to know that I had an awful lot more material that I can share with you. So we, I will be looking at how we can try and get this out there to you more. Um, and would really urge you to get in contact with me directly by email. I, I'm going to get a note of every, what everybody said from the chat, but it might be difficult for me to match names with email addresses. So um, please, please do get in touch with me directly through the website if you would like to, um, to kind of continue the conversation on, on a one-to-one -one level. Um, do sign up for the newsletter because that's where we're going to be 
put in our information on forthcoming events so go to the website and sign up to that there's a link here on this slide that i'm showing you which we'll be sending out to you thanks for the comments lovely to see you all i'm just going to try and see if i can stop sharing for a minute yeah then i can see everybody on the view that's nice oh it's nice to see all your faces I'm, i've only been able to see like a little panel of you all so how lovely and thanks for putting the screens on so i can see yours so shall we oh i just let some more more comments coming in thank you everybody lovely to see you all take care look after yourselves and um hopefully see you next time so thanks very much take care <laughs>